you would, go ahead and be opening your Bibles to John chapter 8. We will get started there tonight. John chapter 8. Good to see everybody out tonight. Have a good number. And uh, I've got a couple of things I want to read here to you real quick. Uh, one is an announcement. I told Randy about it, but it was a text, so instead of him writing it all down, I just he said I could read it. So I got a text this afternoon from Holly Lancaster at 4.05 p.m., and she said, I have some really great news. Jeff baptized Abby in our pool this afternoon. If you don't care, will you announce it at Mammoth tonight? So that's wonderful news. Abby Lancaster was baptized into Christ this afternoon, so we need to remember her in our prayers as she begins, our Christ, begins her Christian walk. It's exciting and encouraging to hear that kind of stuff. A second text I got was in the form of a question from this morning's lesson. So I'll start off with that, and if there are any further questions, I will give you time to ask. So this morning's lesson, I see there are some here tonight who are not here this morning. Uh, but this morning's lesson was taken from John chapter 8. And uh, we talked about casting stones and what is taught there, the event that took place, and all of that. We broke it down into five scenes. <clears throat> so here's the question, pretty a thoughtful question. For John 8, 7, so if you're in your Bibles there, we're looking at verse 7. Is the sin referring to sin in general or a specific sin? So it says, so when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, he that is without sin, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. So, is the sin referring to sin in general or a specific sin? From what is discussed in the subsequent verses, could this be referring to the sin of condemning the woman without witnesses? If you could please clarify the meaning of Jesus' Jesus's question in verse 7. So, that's, like I said, I, that's a pretty thoughtful way of phrasing that question, and I appreciate it. So I thought, and I thought about this ahead of time, you know, I've only got so much time in a sermon, supposedly, I try to remember that. <laughs> you can't cover everything you'd like to cover, I'll just say it that way. So I sat down and thought about it a lot this afternoon and did some more reading, just looking back over the text again, because questions like that make me think, well, what did I miss? And so I see three possibilities here. We know what happened. The woman was, as the text says earlier, Verse 4, she was taken in adultery in the very act. Now, to me, that raises some suspicion. And I, I actually mentioned that this morning. Well, that seems rather convenient. You find somebody in the act, and you take only the woman. So <clears throat> then we know the motivation. They came to him tempting him. They didn't care about the truth. They, if you, and if you remember the, what the Jewish law said, the Jewish law says, the adulterer and the adulteress shall be put to death, and so shall the evil be put away from among you. It takes two people to commit adultery. Um, and then his silence, because they, you remember they, they kept on, they persisted in their, their asking the question. I talked about the mob mentality for a little bit. So then he makes that statement. He that is without sin, let him ca first cast a stone at her. I see three possible answers to that, to what exactly that sin is referring to. The first thought to me is, well, <clears throat> he's hitting on the idea of he knows their motivation. So if you look back up at verse uh, 6, this they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. That was my initial thought. Well, maybe that's by him saying it this way, he's pointing out, Hey, I know your motivation, because we do see that throughout the gospel accounts. Somebody will think something, or a group of people, he'll be teaching or performing a miracle, and people will be thinking something, and he will say, why are you thinking such thoughts in your hearts? Well, so he knows their motivation. So it could be that. He that is without sin among you. Well, they know why they're asking the question, don't they? They're tempting him so that they might have something to accuse him of. Whether he contradicts Moses or he gets in trouble with Romans, the Romans, because I shared with you this morning from John 18, verses 28 to 31, I think it was, that when the Romans occupied Palestine, they took away 
a lot of the Jewish powers, particularly in, in terms of crime and punishment, and specifically capital punishment. He knew their motivation. They knew their motivation. Perhaps that's the sin of John chapter 8 and verse 7. But then there's a second thought that I had. Well, where's the man? Again, if she was taken in the very act of adultery, and they say, well, Moses says this, and they know what Moses said, they also know that there was a man somewhere on scene. So perhaps that's what he's talking about. Um, they're, uh, for whatever reason, only taking the woman. But then the third thought that I had was um, the, well, I guess I would say the, the hypocrisy of these people. And that kind of goes hand in hand with what we've already talked about. Um, they knew what the law said. They quoted it to, well, they quoted part of it to him. Uh, Moses said that such should be stoned, verse 5. Well, again, you go back to Deuteronomy 22, verses 23 and 24. It's very specific about both of them being stoned. And so their, their motivation for asking the question, verse 6, um, the way they handled the whole situation. I, so I think there, to answer that question, I think there are a couple of different ways. I mean, the, the text doesn't specify what that sin is. But obviously there was sin on their part. And we, I mean, you know, us being able to look back at the event and having the text, but then also having the Mosaic text of the law, I think we could look at it in a couple of different ways. But, you know, to nail one down and say, well, this is the sin he was talking about, I don't think we can exactly do that. So I would, I would limit it to one of those two things. Their, uh, their motivation in asking the question, tempting him, but also possibility while quoting the law, they themselves weren't keeping the law. That makes sense because they should have brought the man too. Well, they, they walked out, didn't they? Their, their conscience bothered them and so they left and uh, she was not condemned to death. And that's, that's so important in this part too. And I mentioned that this morning, how people misuse the well, neither do I condemn thee. Well, the, con the condemnation was to death. That was the whole basis of this encounter. Moses said we should stone her. What do you say? He didn't condemn her to death. Uh, so that's how I would answer that question. Any other questions from the sermon this morning? Well, I, I, I mentioned that this morning, about the old, and that's an interesting uh, detail that's put there in the account. If you look at verse 9, then those who heard it being convicted by their conscience left, and it says, beginning at the eldest. Um, I don't know if it's that they have, a, that they have more sin. I think, it's a, I think it's a wisdom issue. Younger people are often more, um, what's the word? Not self-righteous. Uh, more, more quick to act before they think. I know there's one word for that, but I can't think of what it is at the moment. While the eldest could say, yeah, he's right, let's go. The younger might be more, more, we found this, and you know, you even see that in young people today, and I think this is one of the warnings of judgments, and this is kind of getting me off subject, but it just came to my mind as I was thinking about this. You know, young people are the same way today, um, and I would say all of us have a tendency to be, to, that we can be this way. It's very easy to notice somebody else's sin. And for whatever reason, maybe a, 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 maybe a desire to perhaps justify something they themselves are doing or to, to feel more enlightened or whatever. But it seems like young people are willing to act more hastily without thought than older people are. Maybe trying to establish themselves as some authority or something, but I've seen it so many times over the years, and and I would say that I've done it myself. Um, and I think as you get older, wisdom should take hold. And it's like James says in James chapter one: Let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. So.
a couple different thoughts there. Any other questions or comments from the lesson this morning? Right, they realize they're wrong. But now here's the thing, and this is kind of interesting too to, to play into the whole picture. Jesus never, Jesus never said, no, don't stone her. I mean, if you look at the text here, um, here, here's what the law says, what do you say? All he says was, he that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. Well, that's in the context of, okay, what does the law say? You have to have at least two to three witnesses. You can't, what is it, Deuteronomy 17, I think it was, verse 6, that the end of that verse says that um, at the mouth of one witness, no one should be put to death. It takes two or three to establish the, the, the accuracy of a case. He knows the law, and he didn't forbid the stoning of her. It's more to me when you... When you are reading that particular section there of his response to them of, uh, you guys, you're not treating the law right here. You're, you're in violation of the law just as much as she was. And, you know, James picks up on that too, over in James chapter 2. If you violate the law in one aspect, he says, you are guilty of all. Well, these people were obviously very self-righteous because they handled the whole situation incorrectly with the woman, and then they approached Jesus incorrectly because of their motivation, and they needed to be straightened out. Maybe that's the sin of John chapter 8 and verse 7. Two, yeah, it's more than one sin, at least. At least two, yeah. So maybe that's the sin of John chapter 8 and verse 7. Yeah, and that's kind of the point I was trying to make this morning. The eldest, they should know, they should know at least, and they're their age and experience, their wisdom, like I said, hopefully, more so than young people. Anything else on that? Okay. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. It's going to bug me until I think of that word that I wanted to use. may be impetuous. Does that sound right? Impulsive. That's it. Thank you, Ray Lynn. Or Amelia, whichever one you identify as today. <laughs> Impulsive. That's the word I wanted. Yeah. And it, you, I mean, you guys know that just as well as I do, that young people are often more impulsive in that way, ready to point out what other people's, people are doing, as opposed, it's always easier, whether young or old, to look at others as opposed to Examining yourself. All right, Ecclesiastes chapter 5. So I've got this broken up into four sections here. And uh, we'll see how far we get. First seven verses, let's talk about the lips of a fool. The word fool is repeated at least three times in the first seven verses here of Ecclesiastes 5. Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God and be more ready to hear. And odd, I just... Quoted from James chapter 1, be swift to hear and slow to speak. Be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven, and thou upon earth, therefore let thy words be few. For a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by his multitude of words." I like that verse, the end of that verse, and I need that. I need the end of that verse. I would say we all do. Was it, I, I think it's credited to Abraham Lincoln, better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. Well, he may have gotten that from reading the Bible, you reckon? When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. There's our word again. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better is it, 
that thou shouldest not vow, than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. Suffer not thy mouth, call, suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. Neither say thou before the angel that it was an error. Wherefore should be, wherefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thine hands? For in the multitude of dreams and many words there are also diverse vanities. But fear thou God. Um, verse four there. I'm looking at it here. And uh, talking about vows. Well, we'll talk about that here in just a minute. But watch your step when you come into the house of God. Now, historically, in the context, the house of God would be the temple that Solomon built, obviously. And so in regard, in general, as he mentions in verse... uh, Oh, what verse was it? He talks about offering sacrifices, but offering sacrifices when it comes to worship, watch your behavior, watch your conduct. And so I talk about that just a little bit in the outline. The book of Proverbs is replete with warnings to the fool in his mouth. And I've got five verses listed there. Uh, the first one I have, Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 19. I'll read that one to you. It says, in the multitude of words, there wanteth not sin. But he that refraineth his lips is wise. And uh, that's, again, that's, I would say that's something we all need to be reminded of from time to time. So, temple, we understand that, but, but by way of practical application, I put in your outline here, the principle applies to the church just as well. So somebody, if you would please, turn over to 1 Timothy 3 and read verse 15 for us. Make it, make it 14 and 15. 1 Timothy 3, 14 and 15. These things I write to you, though I hope to pass to you shortly, but in time of delay, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourselves in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the and realm of the truth. Okay, when when I think when Solomon and when Paul is talking about Conduct in the house of God. I know the house of God under the Old Testament is the temple. I don't think he's necessarily talking about the physical structure, although that could be included in the discussion. Um, you know, this I got a while we were on vacation. I got a message from a uh, a friend of mine. He preaches in South Carolina, and uh, he's written for the paper for me before, in fact. But he said, you know, how do we? I forget how exactly he worded it, but how do we get people to? Something like to realize that the church, the building is not the sanctuary. And I said, well, you need to teach on the nature of the church. You know, this is just a building. You know, the Christian ought to behave himself appropriately in every structure he finds himself in, or even if he's outside. So I don't think this is necessarily talking about what, again, what Colin just read there. When you come to the church building. But there is the concept there that, well, not the concept, it's the command Timothy, if, I'm not, if I don't get it there in time, I'm writing all this stuff to you so you know how to conduct yourself within the church. And he's not talking about the building. Timothy was left in Ephesus to work on some things that were lacking there, according to chapter 1. Um, well, you need to know how to behave yourself in that setting. So when I look at uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 5, keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God. I think we're, we're not talking about entering a physical structure, but rather about being in the presence of God himself. Well, when are you not in the presence of God? You know, that's, that's another thought I had. Was, you think, I think of Psalm 139 beginning in verse 7. You know, whither shall I free, flee from my spirit? And how can I get out of your presence? Well, you can't. And so you need to behave yourself appropriately at all times. But the, what, what the, the end of 1 Timothy 3.15 says, the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. It's the mainstay of the truth. Nominationalism is not going to teach the truth. They might teach a little bit here and there, but they're not the pillar and ground of the truth. The Lord's church is, and so we as members of that body had better behave appropriately. And uh, I think that's kind of the concept here in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, because you know very well that there are only certain people that had direct access to the temple under the old law. And, you know, not just anybody could go in there at any old time and do whatever they wanted to do. So uh, 
I think that's a good lesson. Verses 4 and 5, he talks about vows. Don't fail to keep it. Um, because if you don't, you're a fool. You know, one of the Ten Commandments is, um, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And typically we talk about, well, you don't say things like, Oh my God, in an exclamatory way, or take Jesus' name in vain when you're angry. You know, uh, and I think that's, I think there's truth to that. But when you read about taking the Lord's name in vain throughout the Old Testament, you know what it's connected to most of the time? Vows. Keep your word. Be a person of integrity. If you make a vow and you fail to keep it, you've taken the Lord's name in vain. You've made it meaningless. Uh, and so take your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 5, and let's just look at that real quick, because Jesus uh, touches on this in the Sermon on the Mount. I'm, we're not going to read all. I've got the Scripture reference there in your outline, but we're not going to read it all. But he talks about what it says in the old law. Thou shalt not forswear thyself. Well, forswear thyself means you don't keep the vow that you took. Thou shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. And you don't have to make a big show of it. If you say you're going to do something, you don't have to, verse 34, um, swear by the heavens or by the earth or anything like that, Jerusalem or anything. You tell somebody you're going to do something, do it. Keep your vows because, again, back to Ecclesiastes chapter 5, if not, you're a fool. And so let your, Matthew 5, 37, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Be a person of integrity, be dependable and and trustworthy, truthful. That's what God's people ought to be. If you give your word, keep it. All right, back to Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. And we talked about this a little bit. This came out a little bit last week, and we'll, we'll stop here because I see what time it is. If thou seest the oppression of the poor and violent perversion of justice, of judgment and justice in a province, marvel not, don't be surprised. For he that is higher than the highest... The King James says, regardeth. The New King James says, uh, high official watches over high official. And so what's he talking about? Well, I put it in your outline here. Watches over or, or is over is the idea of, one, of using one's power for personal gain. You know, we shouldn't be surprised when there's oppression, um, especially for the benefit of the oppressor. You know, we talked about different forms of government last week a little bit and how Oppression has been used throughout history to, to benefit the one in power. And it's, it's so interesting to me that Solomon's writing this. And then you read 1 Samuel chapter 8, where the Israelites come to Samuel and say, listen, we're tired of the judges. We want a king to judge us like all the nations. And so in 1 Samuel 8, 10 to 18, Samuel says, all right, I've talked with God. He's going to let you have what you have, uh, let you have what you want. But here's how it's going to be. He's going to oppress you. Well, then you go to 1 Kings chapter 5 and you read verses 13 through 18 and Solomon has a forced labor from among the Israelites. And then he's writing this. Don't be surprised when you see the oppression of the poor and violent perversion of judgment and justice in a province. Because the guy in charge there, well, he's going to use it to his benefit and there's somebody over him who's going to use it to his benefit. Moreover, the profit of the earth is for all, for the king himself is served by the field. So don't be surprised at that kind of conduct in leadership. And like I said, chapter 4 dealt with that too. Uh, the tears of the oppressed. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and verse 1 he talks about. All right, let's cut it off there. Any questions or comments before we stop though? Okay, appreciate your attention tonight. We'll, the plan is we'll, we'll pick up there. Um, and of course, perhaps if next Sunday night there are questions from the Sunday morning sermon. You will be able to ask those, and then we will get started. And that's another way you can do it. You can write them down. You can text me. You have my number. Send me a message on Facebook, however you want to do that. I don't mind any of that. So we talked a lot about sin today, uh, particularly in the context of John chapter 8 and Jesus dealing with the woman taken in adultery in the very act, but then also the hypocrites who, who misused the law and tempted Jesus. But, you know... When you get to the, as, as I called it this morning, the, the closing scene, 
Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. That's what, that's what we want. And that's one, of the, that's one of the seven or eight I am's of Christ in the book of John. I am the light of life. So sin throughout the Bible is compared to darkness, whereas doing what's right, being obedient, is compared to the light. And there's a, obviously a contrast there. And there's no in-between. We're either in the light or you're in darkness. There's no... So if you were to go into a room, okay, and it was completely dark, and you flipped on the light switch, you're not in the darkness at all anymore. But even if you lit a match, you're not in the darkness anymore. You're either light or dark. There's, there's no middle ground between those two, um, between those two things. And so that's, that's descriptive of our spiritual condition at all times. We're either in the light, walking in the light. I mentioned this morning Psalm 119, 105. Or we are walking in darkness. And yet we're told, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 11. So that choice is in our hands. And we know what the, we know what the remedy is to darkness, to sin. And that is to come to the light, to come to Christ. Because there's no shame in doing what's right. There's always shame in doing what's wrong and trying to hide it and you know, conceal it in darkness or however you want to say that. But... When you're doing what's right, there's no, there's no fear of the light. There's no fear of exposure. So it may be the case that there's someone here tonight who you know your spiritual condition. Maybe you're not in the light. Maybe because, A, you've never obeyed the gospel in the first place. You've never put Christ on in baptism because that's what's required to, to, get, to become a child of light. Or maybe because you've wandered away from the light and you've gone into darkness. Well, you need to come back to it. To the light. There's no other way to be saved, to be right with God. You cannot be in the darkness and be saved. It's not possible. You're either light or dark. So if there's somebody here tonight who needs to, to make themselves right, to obey the gospel or to come back to it, let's do it right now as we stand and sing.